Hello and welcome to Diplomata. I'm Francis Suni. Being a diplomat doesn't only mean you deal with a lot of people and issues, but it also means moving from one place to another every now and then. You get the chance to know different societies, cultures, as well as politics. But then you can also find it hard to be close to the ones you love the most. And when it comes to being a UN diplomat working with UNICEF, it could be one of the most difficult things to see in your life. In this episode, our guest tells us about the beauty and the pain of being a UN diplomat. Valerie Tatton is UNICEF's representative in Timor-Leste. Mistress Valerie Tatton joined the UNICEF Timor-Leste country office in August 2017. As UNICEF representative, she is responsible for all the UNICEF activities under the government of Timor-Leste UNICEF country program of cooperation. These include planning, coordination, partnership, resource mobilization and implementation of programs that contribute to children in the country enjoying their rights for survival, development, protection and participation. Before joining UNICEF Timor-Leste, Mr. Staton served as UNICEF's deputy representative in Thailand, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Madagascar and Rwanda. She headed the child protection section in UNICEF Madagascar and served as child rights legal specialist in UNICEF Cambodia. She has also worked for UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, supporting the Committee of the Rights of the Child. Before joining the United Nations system, Mr. Staton was a member of the Faculty of Law at the University of Liege, Belgium. A national of Belgium, Mr. Staton holds a master's degree in law and has additional academic credentials in international law. She has a wealth of experience in the field of child rights and child protection, strategic program planning, coordination, implementation, monitoring and evaluation. Thank you very much for doing this. To start, would you please tell us a little bit about um, yourself and uh, your background? So my name is uh, Valérie Taton, and uh, right now I'm the UNICEF representative in Timor-Leste. I'm a Belgian national, and uh, my background, um, I study law in Belgium in uh, the 80s, so uh, 1985. And then uh, after the master in law, I did um, study international law uh, for two years. I studied in Belgium in uh, two cities. One is Liège, which is a city where I was born, and the second one was Brussels. And uh, after I had uh, studied, uh, my first job was in the university. I was uh, assistant to a professor, so I was uh, taking care of uh, students. And, but I, I was interested to travel, I was interested to see the world, I was interested to test theories with practice, and so I decided that I need to, to do another job. And that's how I look for a job in the United Nations. Tell us a little bit about your childhood, um, your upbringing in Belgium, if uh, that's okay. So my, my parents, my two parents, they are teachers in a secondary schools. And later on, my mother became the director of the school. And I mention this because in the 60s and 70s, that was not common that you had uh, a woman who was, uh, in fact, the the master of a school for boys, a vocational school for boys and girls. And um, it's, a, it's a school that is very well known in Timor, it's Don Bosco. So uh, I grew up in a, in a village, in a very old house. Um, the house uh, dates like uh, 18th century, so it's a quite very old house. Like a normal girl, I was a lot uh, outside, I was uh, using my bicycle to go to the school when I was in primary school. And then in secondary school I went to a little city nearby the village. So I was taking the bus to go to, to the city and I had very classical uh, type of study. I study uh, mathematics, Latin and ancient Greek, which it's called in Belgium the humanities, that's how we call that. Why the UN? Why not any other organization after, um, after you did your uh, work with, in the academic world? Um, what drove you to the UN? I think what drove me to the UN is really the mandate. 
You know, the, the, the UN is a wonderful hope for humanity. It brings all the states together and it tells the states, please agree how you're going to solve your conflicts, how you're going to discuss with each other in a peaceful manner. So the mandate of the UN is, is fantastic. In addition, you have the human rights. And from the very beginning, you know, from humanitarian law is the human rights during the war time. So moving from humanitarian law to human rights was obvious. And the UN is also, has also a fantastic mandate to um, make sure that human rights are respected. And what made me move to children's rights is that because when I was uh, finishing my uh, law, that's where the UN adopted the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And suddenly, for the first time, you have an instrument for children. And to me, the human rights of the children, that's what opened the door to the human rights to everyone. Tell us about your first days, first days with the UN and in the places you have been working in with the UN. So, you know, to get a job in the UN, that's not easy. And I think the first things I did was to look for internship. So I went to Geneva, uh, I uh, saved money. I was not paid, I was, a, I was an intern. So I went to Geneva during summertime and I started to, as an intern. And when I was there, I think I sent like 150 letters to all the possible agency you have in Geneva. And I probably get about 50 negative responses and the rest of my letters were ignored. So I went back to Belgium and then you had a Belgian cooperation with the United Nations through a program which is also uh, living in, uh, which is also here in Timor-Leste, which is called the UN Volunteers. And Belgium was uh, sponsoring some UN Volunteers uh, in human rights and I applied and I was chosen and so my very first post as a UN was as a UNV for the human rights uh, office in uh, the UN human rights office in Cambodia in 95 just after that Cambodia started to uh, leave its own independence after the MONUC, the, the United Nations forces. You were talking about the Africa room. Um, does that somehow have an influence in you making the decision to join UNICEF? The decision to join UNICEF was not because of Africa but because of children. When I was working in the human rights, uh, you know, the human rights are very vast. And so we were looking a lot about uh, the justice sector, the freedoms, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of political parties, and this and that. But where are the children? Where is their voice? You know, and I really felt strong that human rights have to work for children. That this, to me, is the best investment in human rights that you could do, is to invest in making sure that children understand their rights and that adults also understand the rights of the children. So I had the feeling that UNICEF would be a better organization to actually promote the children's rights. I started by developing some collaboration between my office, it was uh, the Human Rights Office, and UNICEF. We did a, a joint program around uh, exploitation of children and the training of the police. And after UNICEF picked it up, continued the program, and that's how I ended up to work with UNICEF. Would you please tell us a little bit about the history of UNICEF? So UNICEF started in 1946 and originally it was called United Nations International Children Emergency Fund. So it has emergency in the title because it was a relief agency and it, its work was to relieve, to support the children who were affected by the war. It was just after the Second War. So UNICEF started to work for children in Europe at the beginning and then moved to Asia. Tell us about your postings before Timor-Leste. So, uh, as, I, as I explained, I started as a UNV in uh, Cambodia for the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Then I moved to Geneva 
and I work for the Committee on the Rights of the Child, which is in charge of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Then UNICEF Cambodia hired me. That's why I went back to Cambodia and I started my career with UNICEF. After that, in 2001, I went to Madagascar. Initially, in UNICEF, I was working in child protection. That was my technical area. After Madagascar, I went to Rwanda as a deputy representative. Then I came back to Madagascar as a deputy representative. And then I went to uh, DPRK, Democratic Popular Republic of Korea. And then from there, I moved to Thailand, to Bangkok. And after Bangkok, I arrived in Timor-Leste. In all those places you have been working in, there must be experiences and stories that you, you cannot forget. Can you share with us some of them? Yeah, there are many stories I cannot forget. Let me start by Cambodia, one of my biggest stories. You know, when you, are, when you grow up in Belgium and then you have traveled almost only in Europe, going to Asia, and I was, I was young, I was in my 20s, you know, for the first time. Everything was fantastic. Everything was different. Even the shops along the way were different. You know, selling fuel in a Fanta bottle. I thought they had Fanta everywhere until somebody told me, no, no, this is fuel for the motorbikes. You know, so you have to learn all these things. At that time, the Khmer Rouge were still in Cambodia. They still occupy some of the territories. So some of the places were insecure. And one of the very first training we were getting was about the minefields. So we were told not to work in, um, outside the, the roads, and that if you are outside the roads, you have to walk on the stones and things like this, to be, to be careful to the mines. So I have this first experience when I went in the north of Cambodia, in Batambang very close to the places where the Khmer Rouge were still there. And we are in this beautiful countryside, only one car. There is a sort of hill, and on the top of a hill, there is a temple. So we go with a driver to look at the temple. And next to the temple, there is a, how you call it, a canon, a, you know, to shoot. And me, in, you know, this thing. So I'm very curious. So I go out of the car and I start walking to see this canoe, right? And the driver, the Cambodian driver, called me, he says, stop, stop. If there are no soldiers around, it means they have put mines. So suddenly I realized that maybe I'm walking with mines around me, right? So this is where you have your training coming back and you look at the big stones trying to jump on the stones to come back to, to, the, to the car. That was, in Cambodia, I had a lot of experience like this. When I experienced facing people with guns, you know, sometimes shootings, uh, that, that was, yeah, you, you have to adjust to that. So certainly it's one of my, uh, my big uh, souvenirs. And I have a lot of, uh, of other souvenirs. Madagascar, Madagascar is a beautiful country. It's like Timor, but in, in bigger. It's a very, it's one of the biggest islands in the world. And it's beautiful. You have a lot of forest and you have this famous animal that is called the Lemurian, that exists only in Madagascar. Beautiful. So in Madagascar, what I, I would remember is the, the countryside, the kindness of the people, the sea, the contrast. It's called the red, uh, the red Island because in many places it's very red, in other places it's very green. And then there too we experienced a change of government. And uh, during about six months the capital city was blocked. So no plane could uh, land, uh, you could not find fuels and you had to adjust. And I think that as a UN person because you change of countries, you face all those different type of political situations that you have all the time to adjust. Adjust your work, adjust your way of being, um, adjust your life. Um, so yes, I have a, a lot of uh, souvenirs. 
Randa, I will pick up the day where I was in the office and suddenly everything moved around. Earthquake. Not in Kigali, it was uh, at the border with the Congo, but it was on a Sunday, you know, and I was by chance in, in the office that day. And suddenly you have to think that there is a population that needs support. So very quickly, you ask your team to come. You try to find information, how many people are affected, you know, what are the, the damage. And then you try to send as much as possible support to, to the place. So we send a team to uh, see what was the, the problems, but we anticipate there were a lot of issues with wash. So we set up like uh, temporary toilets, we set up tents for the population very, very quick. In, in one day we were already, you know, putting, putting things there. It's a, yeah, it's a strong souvenir. It's a str very uh, strong human story. And do you think that's the role UNICEF has been playing across the world? Uh, giving hope to make, to make the world better? Yes, UNICEF, I strongly believe that uh, you have to invest in children and this investment will make the world better. And if you see these latest years, all these uh, youth movement around, you know, I mean, there's Greta is very famous, but there are so many other young activists. That's also what the young people think. And that's what you thought when you were also a young person. I'm sure that if you really dig inside your, your memory, you will remember that at that time, you felt that you will make a better world, that the world can be different than the world that you hear it. And I think that UNICEF Rose is really to, to harness, you know, this, this power of, of the young people and of the children instill dreaming that the world can be a better place. That's what we have to make. And UNICEF is there just to support that, to support those young people, those children, and also to remind the government that when they ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, they took a formal commitment to respect these rights. You know, so yes, I think, I think UNICEF believes that you can transform the world, and that's what I would call hope and hope is, is powerful. Thank you very much. Tabot bela protege tabot ni an, husi moras ing oint, li husi hahalok simples hanesan faseliman bebe ko sabaw no uza be mosh nebe maksuli. You're talking about the part of the conventions that are very important uh, on the issue of children. In terms of your practical work, how do you do or implement those, uh, those four important elements in, in Timor-Leste? So in Timor-Leste, we have uh, four main programs. One is uh, called Child Survival, and it covers the health of the child and also maternal health. It covers the child nutrition, and it covers water, sanitation and hygiene. Because all these elements, nutrition, water, sanitation, hygiene and health, they are linked together. You cannot do health without proper water and clean and safe water, proper hygiene, 
proper sanitation. The same for nutrition. If you want the child to get the best benefit of the nutrition, you need also to ensure that the water is clean and is uh, potable. You have to ensure that and is safe, in fact. This is the right term, it's safe. And uh, you have to make sure that you have good hygiene practices and, um, and good sanitation. You know, washing hands, for instance, save a lot of children from a lot of diseases, not only from the coronavirus. Yeah, because it's through the hands that you get a lot of bacteria, virus, germs, and then you put them on you, and then they go to your mouth. So if you have a proper uh, hygiene, this helps a lot for the, the good health of the child. So this is the very first program. The second program is looking at early uh, education and education. If I focus on early education, it's because most of the time we think that the children will start at basic school, around six, you know, and they have to start uh, learning literacy and numeracy. But in fact, the child start to learn even in the womb. He start to learn when he's born and when she's born. And so it's very important that from the very beginning you have a lot of stimulation of the child. First with the parents, that's what is happening in the house for the two first years, but then in early childhood education. And so part of our program is really to promote the early childhood education and bring it to the communities. Because right now, only one child out of four go to early childhood education in Timor. So it means that three child out of four don't go to early childhood education. And one of the programs of UNICEF is to see how can we go faster, get more children having access to this early childhood education. And that's why we set up what we call the community, uh, the community ECD, the community early childhood education. So it's very, very important. And then when the child go to school, we have to make sure that the school deliver a quality a curriculum, that the children have a seamless transition from all the grades. You know that uh, one child out of three repeat grade one in Timor. So this is very worrying. It's an indication that they go to school a little bit too late, you know, because they don't have this early education. So when they go in primary school, it's the first time that they are in the schools. And so we have to really look at this when they go into the school. How can we increase the number of children who will make it to the second uh, grade? But of course, basic education is nine years, huh? so you have to make sure that primary school is okay, then also the, the secondary schools. And this is why UNICEF is looking at the whole um, learning of the child. And we are focusing not only on what the parents like to see. They like to know how, how, that the child know how to write, how to know how to read, but there are a lot of other skills that children need to get. Like how to behave in society, how to uh, solve conflicts between them. And even with the 21st century now, we have to think about the digital literacy. So how can children be better to use computers, have access to internet and this and that. So all this is part of the education program of UNICEF. And so we are looking at not only what they learn, but also their skills. The third program is child protection. In child protection, we focus a lot on the issues of violence against children. Um, we know in Timor uh, that violence against children exists. It's also used as a mean of uh, education sometimes. You know, you slap children or you speak hard to children. And sometimes people don't understand why these methods are not necessarily the best for the child development because they, they harm the child, you know. It can be even measured in the brain. So if you do a brain scan, you can see a child that is brought out of a lot of love, a lot of um, uh, attention, care, 
And the child who goes through traumatized, who suffer violence, you will see this in the scan of the brain. Why? Because your brain will, it's like a sponge. So everything which is happens to the child is recorded in, in the brain. And it will determine how the brain will make the connections, you know, between the different neurons. So that's why this violence is very harmful. Because you will see that it will affect the child development. It will affect how the child grows. It will affect how the child relates to other people. And it may also end up in the child using violence himself or herself, right? So uh, fighting against violence against children, this is very important. But to do that, we need a full set of other workers. And that's what we call the social welfare workers. And these professionals are very important because these are the professionals that will interact with the parents and with the community and bring this link between the parents, the families and the communities and support the family. So we have also a parenting program uh, as part of it because we think that parents uh, are very important and we need to, be, to help the parents to be better parents. So the, the four pillar of our program is uh, social policy and inclusion. So this program is looking a lot uh, on data for children. Uh, why do we need data? Because we need to understand what is the situation of children. So data, uh, how do we collect data? For instance, we do survey. Uh, two days ago, we launched the nutrition and food survey in Timor-Leste. And this will allow us to know what is the status of nutrition of children. We will measure the children, we will take their weight, uh, and we will see if there is any issue about uh, undernutrition or overnutrition. And so with this program, we work a lot with the DGS uh, and looking at all types of, of statistics. We also, for instance, measure poverty. Is poverty different in children than in adults? So in Timor-Leste is the case. There are more poverty in children than in adults. And all this gives us indication about the vulnerability of the children and also what are the priority areas where UNICEF should invest is little funding and is, is a small support because we think that these areas can make a difference. So poverty in children is, is, a, is important. Um, because what we want to, to do with all this data, with all this information, is be able to advocate, to convince people to look at children. I give you a, a challenge as a journalist. Uh, you have your news every day. Measure how many times you talk about the children. To me, this is the, main, the most indicators. When I see the declaration of the Council of Ministers, you know, they, they publish the declaration every week, I look whether they talk about children. I look where are children visible, you know? Are we talking about them? Are we talking with them? Are we letting them speak out about, uh, about their issues? And so this, this program also about social inclusion, it's also about that, huh? it's, it's about you know, the youth engagement, how youth engage in the society. In Timor-Leste, Timor-Leste did a fantastic thing. You created this national youth parliament. It's remarkable. And what is remarkable is that it's funded by the state, right? And so every three years, there's a new, uh, new parliament. So, fantastic. So now the next, next question is, what is the influence of the National Youth Parliament. They give their opinions. Are those opinions heard? Do they influence politics or policies, not politics, policies that matter for children, for instance? So at UNICEF, because let's be honest, even at UNICEF we are not good at, you know? If we think that children are an important part of our society, they should be in everything that we do when we develop our program, when we implement our program, they should be everywhere. So we are also learning, like everybody else, you know, 
how to make this voice matter for us first, but also for the society in general. And us as adults, we have to learn how to listen, how to hear their vo this voice. That's not easy, it does not come naturally. We like to talk to adults. That is quite interesting. We'll go a little bit deeper into those issues a bit later. But before, who do you work with? Uh, obviously the Ministry of Health, but any other partners that you work with in implementing uh, the, pro the programs? And also, where do you, in where in Timor do you uh, work to implement those, uh, those programs? So the way UNICEF works is that every five years we develop what we call a country program. And this country program is approved by a board of, of states. It's decided uh, by this board under the ECOSOC in the, in the United Nations. Based on this program, uh, we uh, work very closely with the government to develop this program first, huh, before it is approved, and then to implement. So the very first partner of UNICEF is definitely working with the government and supporting the government efforts to implement the convention. So in Timor, we work with a lot of different ministries. You, you said the Ministry of Health. We also worked with the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sport, with the Secretariat of Youth and Sport, the Secretary of State, with SECOM. We work with the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Social Solidarity and Inclusion. Um, we work also at uh, the concentrated level with the municipalities, uh, authorities. We work with the Ministry of Public Work when it's about uh, water and sanitation. Uh, we work um, also, as I said, with the local authorities and sometimes for some programs which are at the community, we even go down to the Aldea level. But we don't only work with the government, we also want to work with the civil society. So we have a lot of uh, partnerships with uh, NGOs, both uh, local NGOs and also international NGOs. And we have a broader partnerships with uh, all the, the states and all the entities that trust UNICEF to implement the program in, in Timor-Leste. So for instance, the European Union, the government of New Zealand, um, these are uh, the government of Japan. These are very uh, important partners for UNICEF in Timor-Leste. And we have partners outside Timor-Leste. So UNICEF, for instance, has what we call national committees. Those national committees, they work in some countries to raise funding and also advocate for uh, what is happening, like what we do in Timor-Leste. So we work for, with two uh, committees in Australia and in New Zealand. And these committees also help us to talk about Timor-Leste outside. And if you continue to look at the partnerships, we work with the media, we work with you today, and uh, we have some uh, programs also uh, with, uh, with journalists. And we also work with the private sector when we can leverage the resources for the private sector. So for instance, uh, yesterday we launched this um, uh, hotline for psychosocial support for children and adolescents, one, two, one, two, three. It's a free hotline and we could do it because the three telecom operators, they associated to the Ministry of Health and to us to do, uh, to do this partnership. So the private sector can play a very big role in changing and promoting the rights of the children in Timor-Leste. And we work with the academics, I forget, University of uh, Timor-Leste also. So it's, qu it's quite diverse. Do you cover the whole country in, in, implement, in the implementation of those programs? The programs aims at the whole country, but not every program which is happening locally is everywhere. So for instance, when we do a national survey, like the one I, I said before, the nutrition survey, it covers all countries. When we uh, assist the government to 
for new policies, new guidelines. This it aims to the whole country. But sometimes for specific interventions, we zoom down on certain municipalities. So it really depends on which program we are talking about. You hinted a number of challenges facing the children in Timor Leste, a lack of early education, violence against children, um, adults not listening enough to the children. What are the other biggest challenges do you think facing the children of Timor Leste? The, there are many, many big challenges. First of all, uh, Timor Leste is still a young country, and so. The institutions in Timor-Leste are also uh, very young and I think what uh, Timor-Leste has achieved in a relatively short time is remarkable. Everybody says this, we have to acknowledge that. Uh, because not all new countries succeed. There are other countries which sometimes are even older than Timor-Leste which are not so good as Timor-Leste. But this said, there are many challenges. I think the government uh, usually raised the challenge in nutri nutrition and the indicators that is used is the stunting. Stunting is one out of two children under five is stunted in Timor-Leste. It means the, the child is too short for his age. And stunting showed that, you know, stunting does not happen once. Stunting show a deprivation over time, right? And this is why this indicator is, is, uh, is worrying. If the children do not have a good nutrition, and when I say good nutrition, I don't only talk about good food, but getting micronutrients, you know, all the uh, vitamins, all the irons and, uh, this, that they need for their development and for their brain development. And if they don't get it, at a young age, especially before two and before five, then the brain will not develop fully. And you cannot reverse that. This is why investing in uh, fighting against malnutrition is so important and should be a real, real priority. And when I say investing, I'm really focusing on the small children the 1,000 days, and then the first five years, promoting breastfeeding. There's Timor-Leste every year. Don't only do a week of promotion, there's a month of promotion of breastfeeding, the month of August. Why? Because it's absolutely important. Every mother can breastfeed their child, but sometimes they need a little bit of support to understand how to do it well. And during six months, Breastfeeding is enough. You don't even need water. So that's something that UNICEF wants really to, to focus on because if we succeed to uh, improve the nutrition of the young child and that in addition we look at the stimulation of the child, the care of the child, what I uh, said before, the early education and the early development of the child, is the hygiene and access to water, we are setting the best conditions for the child to grow, to learn, and to be a very productive adult for the future. So it starts early. When we talk about education, I hear a lot of, obviously, higher education is very important, but the education of the child before six is as important. If you miss that, you will not get good people in higher education. So it's not one or the other. It's looking at the continuity of learning from the very, very small child to the grown child. Education, to me, needs a huge investment in, uh, in uh, Timor-Leste. Quite sometimes that policies that are being set in the country Positioned, positioned children outside the radar. Um, in that situation, what does UNICEF do? Do you do advocacy or uh, to make sure that children are always included in, uh, in uh, considered in, in the policy making in the country? 
I think, uh, first of all, there are so many priorities. So, and so many things need to happen huh? in, in every country, and in particular in a country that is growing like, like Timor. So I understand there are a lot of different priorities, but as UNICEF, our conviction is that the very first priority are the children. And what we do is that, yes, we advocate, we talk, we try to get uh, data to show uh, what we want to say. We try to convince people, we try to uh, uh, get allies, uh, influencers, because it has to be a conviction, you know? It has to be in your heart that you think that this is the most important thing that I want to do. And I want to do it now for the children who are here now. Not when they have the right to vote, but for them when they are here now as the, the baby child, the young child, the adolescent child. They, they, because this is the critical period for them. The transformation you have as a human being between your birth and 18 years old is terrible. If you think huh? you are like this, you can uh, be two meters. So the physical transformation, the emotional transformation, the intellectual transformation, it's tremendous what is happening in these first 18 years. You know, you, do, you change more in these first 18 years than between 18 years and, and my age. With the current situation of COVID-19, which has affected very much every group of society, how do we think the Timor uh, has responded uh, to the situation in relation to the children uh, situation uh, in Timor Leste? I think Timor Leste, I, I want really to praise the government of Timor Leste for its response to COVID-19 on the front of health because it contained the, the transmission and at present uh, there is no case and there is a surveillance system on and also uh, putting in place very quickly uh, the Escolaba UMA program. The, if you think about it, on a Monday the schools are closed and the next Monday you have already a TV program for all the children in Timor-Leste in the morning and the afternoon. Two weeks after, all the curriculum are, in, are online. And Timor-Leste is the third country, is among, sorry, is among the three first country to use the learning passport, which is launched by UNICEF and Microsoft. So Timor-Leste, believe me, has been in fact uh, a showcase in the world for UNICEF on education because of what the government of Timor-Leste could do for the education of the children. It's TV, it's radio, it's online program, it's printed material. The biggest challenge now is that the school will reopen and we need the children to come back. And that's not an easy thing because the children, you know, distance learning, this is not like learning in the classrooms. And obviously not all children have followed the distance learning. Some follow very regularly, some follow less regularly. It depends a lot on the support that they got from the parents and how much the parents encourage them to learn. So this is a big challenge. That's why parents are, are so important. But if you think about it on a very, as an opportunity, and I think that's what we should think, we could launch with the Ministry of Education a distance learning program, a full distance learning program for the very first time in a very short time. All this program can be used now by the Ministry of Education to reimagine and reinvent schooling. We know that in Timor-Leste there are still children who drop out of schools, especially when they go to secondary schools, you have a lot of dropouts, so children quit schools. And more you go in age, more they quit schools. So all this new uh, learning methodology needs to be used. And in addition, it will also um, 
provide to children the digital skills. Digital skills are very important in the 21st century. You need to know how to use internet. You need to know how to use smartphones. It's also the direction of a digital country or e-governance. You need your citizens to be equipped with the good skills to know how to use internet. But you also need that they have some telephones or tablets or computers, right? So there's still a lot of needs that we have to, to work out. But COVID-19 gives the opportunity to reinvent the education. And I think that's what we should look. We should not come back to what was before. We should take what is good, what worked well, what went fast, and use it for the future. I think also similarly in the Ministry of Health, um, the government has also allocated a big budget for transforming the, the health systems. It's also very good. You will have more equipment. There's a lot of trainings going on. And this will last beyond the COVID and make Timor ready because pandemia, we may get rid of COVID-19, but we are not getting rid of pandemia because we know that in the world of today, pandemia will come back. Other ones, other, other type of, uh, of pandemia. So we will be better prepared. One of the fantastic things that I find in the COVID-19 and we, we, is the way that people suddenly find that washing hands with soap is absolutely necessary. UNICEF has been working in Timor-Leste around hygiene for many years. And we've been promoting hand washing in schools. There's even a little song that children, all children know. But still people don't wash hands, right? They know the song, but they may not wash them. Or they may not uh, have soap around. Or they may not put the little money to buy the soap. A soap is not expensive. But still, you don't buy it. You will buy, maybe you will buy something else that you find more important than the soap. But COVID-19 make everybody think that soap is important. Suddenly, you have people claiming that the soap has disappeared in the marketplace where UNICEF put the stands, right? There's no more soap. Or, and the schools need soap. Everybody needs soap. I think the soap industry or the soap selling in Timor-Leste has grown up so fast. So, in fact, what could be achieved in terms of communication and changing behavior for washing hands is fantastic. And it's not only going to help Timor-Leste for the COVID-19, it's going to help Timor-Leste for every child disease that is hygiene related, you know? And it will have a, an influence on uh, the child health and the child survival. So this I want also to congratulate because we checked, we checked uh, in, even in remote places whether people have heard about how you prevent yourself from COVID and everybody knows hand washing. Yeah? So it's a big success. It's a big success and it goes in the right direction. So this is a hard time, but let's see all the opportunities and all the learnings that can help us to use this hard time in a good way. And to wrap up, if there was anything that Timor-Leste needed to do better uh, in terms of uh, making sure that children are, are getting what they need, what would that be in UNICEF's perspective? There are many opportunities in Timor-Leste. To me, Timor-Leste is a country of hope, is a country of opportunities. It is a country where you can make things happening. And when I look at the COVID-19 and all the efforts of the government and what the Ministry of Education, for instance, could set up the Escola Bauma and putting all the curriculum of, uh, of Timor-Leste on internet for the first time, uh, it has so much potential, so much potential on tra of transforming the education in Timor-Leste. I really hope that all together, you know, we size these opportunities. We could 
succeed to do so many good things, not only UNICEF, many of our partners and, and together with the government, we could succeed to, to do a lot of very positive things. But let's draw the lessons out of it and see what, what is good and what needs to, to continue to transform the society. And to me, the education definitely needs a very big focus and as I said from the very early age not only when they go to the basic education and the formal uh, schools it's about learning and learning starts in the family so let's look at what we can do to support the families to support the, the school after and to support the child all along his learning path from uh, from his birth to uh, when he goes to university, if he goes to university. Thank you very much. This has been very interesting. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Hello, how are you? Hi, I'm fine. Thank you. How are you too? Good, thank you. Uh, what is your name? Uh, I'm Veronica Correa. And what's your position in UNICEF? Uh, I'm working as a communication for development for a, a child survival and development section in UNICEF. And with that position, what do you do every day? Okay, actually the communication for development is a cross-cutting issue. So within the GSD section, we have like three main programs, uh, maternal, newborn and child health, uh, water sanitation and hygiene, and also nutrition. So uh, my main role is like uh, to oversee the communication for development aspect for all three uh, programs. So uh, I mainly work in, uh, with the Minister of Health to provide the technical support and assistance for the implementation of communication uh, for development initiative that uh, respond to the uh, issues of maternal, newborn and child health as well as nutrition and uh, WASH. With the Ministry of Health, how regular do you work with them? Okay, uh, with the UNICEF, we are more working on strengthening the system within the, uh, with the government. So uh, I have really uh, regular work with the Ministry of Health in terms of uh, in coordinating for all activities that we are uh, uh, doing here. So uh, uh, like everything that uh, we are, uh, every intervention for communication for development or in other terms is like uh, health promotion or social behavior change communication is mainly uh, in partnership with the uh, government. So uh, for every intervention that uh, we are doing, we are doing collaboratively. So like uh, for instance, like uh, we develop messages uh, that related to the uh, key uh, health issues like uh, 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 nutrition, wash, and uh, maternal, newborn, and child health. It's for short. It's a uh, MNCH. Uh, so we have quite. I have quite intensive work with, uh, with them. So, what is the role of uh, UNICEF representative in your work? Okay, As, uh, one of the component in communication for development is uh, uh, advocacy. Uh, like uh, there need to be a policy dialogue because. In C4D, we are trying to uh, create demand by providing uh, messages to the community and uh, so that the community, they can have informed decision for a, uh, healthy, uh, to adopt the healthy behavior. So uh, our, in that work, we also have some kind of like uh, work for enabling environment, which is more related the, to policy development, guidelines, uh, which is, uh, that's the role that linked to the, our representative uh, uh, representative role, how to advocate and to bring the issues uh, of children to the uh, decision making level, uh, level. And also the other part of that is like uh, resource uh, mobilization. So uh, for, to make sure that program is running, we need a resources to, to implement the project. So that's one of the uh, role of the representative and also in um, partnership as well. 
and also how the representatives can advocate a Timor in a global and regional level as well. So, you know, uh, uh, how because we are so small country, so uh, sometimes people see the a number of population, they think that Timor is small, is nothing. But our representative roles, how to bring the Timor Leste into agenda, that Timor Leste is also uh, have a, a society, have a population that need to be caring of. How long have you been working with the representative? Uh, I'm lucky enough because I was here before the representative uh, uh, joined. Uh, because in uh, UNICEF, the representative mandate is for three years. And I, uh, so when Madam Valerie joined the UNICEF, I already been here. So it's about uh, almost three years to work with the rep. How is it like working with her in your office? She's great. Of course, uh, uh, she's been a really great advocate as well. Uh, she always uh, been children as a central uh, uh, center for every intervention that we have. And uh, she's a very visionary st strategic. She really wants the best for the children of Timor Leste. And, uh, and apart for, from being like a good advocate uh, for the uh, you, uh, every issues that children face in Timor Leste. She also always uh, try her best to create a great environment for uh, staff, uh, like uh, balancing for like everybody who work for UNICEF, like international, no matter you're from international or national, you always have good uh, relationship. And uh, the other uh, aspect is like uh, staff well-being is also really taking care on, on that as well. So if you see that we have playground there, we've been dreaming like uh, to, because UNICEF is working for children. Sometimes our children is complain because they think that they are out of that children that we are working for. So they, oh, you are working for, uni, uh, for children, but not for us, so, but they are also children. So uh, by her joining us, she also really try to best to make this office is like environmental friendly for the children as well. So that's why we are having this playground uh, da down there, a playground for the kids where staff can also bring uh, their children uh, to work and also especially for uh, staff that uh, have newborn baby, like uh, we are suggesting like uh, re uh, for UNICEF WHO recommended uh, exclusive breastfeeding so we are not only telling people to exclusive breastfeeding, but we also our, uh, facilitate our staff to do so. So we have a breastfeeding room here for staff that they can bring their children uh, to, to work. So she's been very supportive as well uh, for every staff and also caring for the well-being of staff. Thank you very much for doing this. Would you please tell me your name? Yeah, my name is Dennis, Dennis Mhoza. Those are my names. And what's your position in uh, the UNICEF office? Yeah, in UNICEF, uh, I had a program, which we call a section in UNICEF, which is called Child Survival and Development, which basically means it covers three programs. Health, which is maternal, newborn, and child health. And then the other program is nutrition. And then there's water, sanitation, and hygiene. So the three programs combined are called Child Survival and Development. So I had that program. Since you're a doctor, how do you use that part of, um, of skill in your, in your work? Yes, thank you very much. I think uh, being a doctor, you know, the medicine has got their two parts. There's this clinical medicine, which is basically being in a health facility, receiving patients. But there's another aspect of health, which is public health. So that's the biggest part now that we support, which is supporting the Ministry of Health mainly and other sectors. So we support them right from the policy development, strategic planning, capacity building of the health providers, and uh, making sure that we do the monitoring of the service provision. So that's basically what the section does 
for all the three programs that I talked about, which aim at ensuring that the children and the people of Timor-Leste are healthy and they have, have healthy lives. And who are your direct counterparts on your daily work in the office? Our main counterpart is the Minister of Health. Of course, through the WASH program that I talked about, we also work with the Minister of Public Works, mainly the Directorate General of Water and Sanitation, but we have other partners. Our sister, UN sister agencies, we have uh, bilaterals, we have multilaterals, then we have also national or uh, non-government organizations, both international and national. Of course, the civil society is also our big partner in our work. Apart from the government, um, who are your other partners? Uh, we work with, as UNICEF, we work with many partners. So government, you said it uh, quite very well. Uh, we work with so many partners, but mainly this program that I mentioned, we work mainly with the government, Minister of Health, Minister of Public Works, through the Directorate General of uh, Water and Sanitation. But our main partners, apart from government, are the UN sister agencies. We have the bilaterals, we have multilateral organizations, we have international and local non-government organizations, we have the civil society organization, but we also opened up the part part partnership with the academia, academic institutions. Yeah, so those are our main partners, and the civil society organization also is a critical partner to our work. How do you relate your work to UNICEF representatives uh, work in the office? Uh, in general terms, uh, the role of a representative, so the program that I talked about, what we do, the, there, is, there are three, four main types of support that we get from the representative. As I talked about, our work runs from the policy level. So the representative's role, and in this case, uh, Madame Valerie, her role is when we're doing policy development and policy dialogue, that's where a representative comes in. So Valerie, in terms of policy dialogue with the government, with our partners, that's the, her biggest role. The second role that is major in whatever we do, we need resources. So Ms. Valerie, as the UNICEF representative, her other big role is mobilizing resources. So we cannot do what we do without having the resources that are required. So that is another role that she supports the program. Advocacy is a third one, a big one, because we need to make the work that we do known to the donors, known also to the people of Timor-Leste. So that is mainly the three pillars that represent the, the Miss Valley helps us to run our programs efficiently. Of course, is the partnership. I talked about our partners. The representative is critical in opening the door to different partners. So if we have new partners in the area, in the domain that we serve, then the representative goes, knocks at the doors, and opens our collaboration with our partners. So that is basically the three, the fourth major roles that a representative does. Of course, there's another one I talked about what we ship supports externally, but the staff welfare, because we use our staff to do the job. So the representative, Madame Valerie, ensures that the staff welfare is at the top because they are the arms and the tools that support the government. So that is basically in a nutshell that what, supports, what support we get from the representative. And how do you find working with uh, Ms. Valerie as the representative? Oh, I have been here for over one year now. And I think we have had excellent relationships because the, the four things that I talked about, I forgot to mention even accountability because as a representative, she makes sure that the resources that we get from partners, the resources that we get from philanthropists, they are used efficiently because they are resources for children. So in my one year here, we have had very good relationships where she supports in those five big areas and we have had, you know, we have had her always support us if we need to do the process dialogue, want to talk to the minister, the book appointment, we prepare for her, then she goes and advocates and 
We have always had successful advocacy. The partnership she has built around our work is very critical. And of course, the staff were prayer, which I mentioned, because we have, she has helped me have a motivated staff. And uh, I think, uh, I hope and I am praying that it continues because uh, it's just one year, but we still have time ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Our special guest, Mrs. Taton, has told us a lot about her diplomatic career as well as UNICEF and its work in Timor Leste. It has been exciting to have the time to talk to her. I hope you have enjoyed the program and thank you very much for watching. I'm Francis Suni and I'll see you on the next episode of Diplomata. Bye for now.